So my suggestion is that, you know, we still maintain our safety measures and, and watch out for the distancing. It's, it's still critical that we do that. Uh, let's look and see how things go. I'm very excited about us coming back into the church very soon. Uh, we're, we're strategizing and trying to get everything together so that we can come in and we can be very safe and, and I'm anticipating us to do that. But I do want to hear from God. I want God to really give us clearance on, on, on that uh, because I don't want to just move because everybody else is moving. There was a thought one time that said that when all else are losing their minds and you can keep your head, that's when you are a man, my friend. So we have to keep our head. We have to stay sturdy and steadfast and we have to watch out for, for ourselves and each other, of course. I mean, we want to live and not die. We want to be of good health. And so we've got to, we've got to trust the Holy Spirit to really lead and guide us uh, concerning this time and, and what we need to be doing in this time. Uh, I want to go right into the word. I've got a word from the Lord. Um, and, and I want to I want to go into the word, but the word today is that uh, we know we know all things work together. We know all things work together because we love God. We know all things work together for good because we love God. I want to talk about that today because I think it's essential right now that we really trust God and, and understand that even though we're going through these challenging times, things are still working together for the good that God has ordained. Let us pray, and then, then we'll go right into the word. Heavenly Father, right now, we humble ourselves in the name of Jesus Christ, and we bless you, we glorify you, we worship you, we praise you. Father God, we give you the honor, we give you the glory, we give you the praise. You have drawn these that are watching, or are a part of this service, to hear a word from you. Therefore, Father God, I decrease. I move completely out of your way and, and pray that you might just use me for your glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Father God, let it all be you and not none of me because we need a word from the Lord. And I'm asking, Father God, that you touch ears, that they might hear what you're saying specifically to them and uh, to us, and then touch eyes that we might see it from the perspective that you're giving it to us in the name of Jesus Christ. Touch every heart so that we might understand and be in agreement with you and receive your word. And Father God, we give you the honor, we give you the glory, we give you the praise for the victory. Uh, I, I, I want you to go with me to Romans uh, chapter, chapter 8. And in and, and Romans, Romans, the whole whole book of Romans or the letter of Romans is, is actually about the grace of God. Um, it's a very interesting piece, but it's one, of, it's one of the most powerful letters in the Bible because it's where Paul literally goes in and he really, he really uh, teach on grace and, 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 and the shifting from the law to grace. Uh, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's necessary to get, get good understanding of, of the fact that we are not under the law any longer. It's been fulfilled by Jesus Christ and we are, we are in grace. Chapter 3 and chapter 8 are the, are the verses, I mean the chapters that I think that he was most thorough in explaining how God has given us salvation, sanctification, justification, and manifestation of his righteousness unto us. Chapter 3 goes into it, but, but what Paul was dealing with at the time was he was dealing with a nation, the, the Israelites, who, who did not necessarily understand, first of all, that God had made this transition. Even though Jesus said, I'm going to tear this temple down and I'm going to rebuild it. What Jesus was saying was, I'm going to take this that's not working. We're going to, we're going to do away with it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a system. I'm going to bring forth what will work. Well, even though God gave the law and the law is holy, we could not do it. Man could not do that. So during that time, the, the, the is when Paul wrote this letter to Israel, they were between the law and grace. They were they were caught up in, 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 in what God had done versus what God is doing. And, and sometimes, sometimes we get to be, we do the same thing. We, we get caught up in, in what, what God did before and then what God is doing now. And so they were, they were in a unique place. And so Paul was writing because he was concerned about them. And, and, and he said, look, okay, now what God has done is he has made things better and he has made things easier for us to have right, intimate, meaningful, and purposeful relationship with him. And, and so it was not easy for them to just say, okay, we got to put down this way of doing things and pick up this new way of doing things. Because think about it, in the old way, they had done that for hundreds of years. They had offered up the various sacrifices. They had gone, allowed the priest to go in and pray for them and, 
And so it was so much that was going on that they were used to and familiar with that it was extremely difficult for them to make the, the changes and the adjustments. So when you read the letter that Paul wrote to the Romans or wrote to the Christians in Rome and the letter of Hebrew is the, and, and as well, Paul is dealing with the, with the Hebrews, uh, the Israelites, and explaining to them that, okay, look, what God has done is, a, is, is the only way that we can have a relationship with God. The old way no longer works. And I know as we're transitioning back into life and, and, and functioning and, and moving forward into things, things are not the same. They are different, and they are different because they must be different. And so we have to make those adjustments. But they, was ex they were extremely difficult to make for them because, remember, they were used to, I mean, they were used to going in and bringing all these sacrifices. I mean, they had done that. They're generations and generations, they had been taught that. So here now, Paul comes, and of course, Peter did the same. Paul comes and saying, look, we've, you've got to make this transition because there's no other way that God has for us to be saved other than Jesus Christ. And so, so when he when he wrote the letter to to the to the to the Christians in Rome, he he was he he got over in chapter eight, and I'm I'm jumping over there because it's really in, in the middle of the letter. But he had he had done very well with the grace and, and 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 the mercy and the sanctification and the righteousness of God. But 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 he understood that that people still didn't understand how God could do that or why God could do that because they didn't see the need for it to be done. What they didn't really understand was that, that the way that they were doing it, based on what God had given them, which was the law and the commandments, they could not fulfill those. They could not do those. They could not do those with the right spirit and the right mindset. Of course, you can, you can feel like you're doing something right, but when you have underneath issues, you're missing the whole point. And that's what was going on was that you had the priest that could preach it and teach it, but they couldn't live it. That's what Jesus told him. He said, you know, you, you, can, you can teach the law, but you can't live it. You have to live what you teach because they didn't have the power. We were born in sin and shaped in iniquity, so they didn't have the power to live it. So they were, they were, they were concerned, and, but Paul understood, and he knew that they needed to know something new. And so he, 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 he's, he's writing all the doctrine on, on, uh, on, on salvation. He's talking to the Jews. He said, there's no such thing now as a Jew or a Greek, whoever accepts Jesus Christ. There's no, the circumcision is not going to mean anything now. Whoever accepts Jesus Christ are the children of God. So he gets over into chapter 8, and, and he began you know, over, oh, down in verse 20. And I want to I read that. Uh, chapter 8, verse 20, he gets here. And, and after he's expounded, he understands that there are still some challenges, and he's understood that there were, there were still some, some lack of understanding. And I'm going to tell you this. Now, this is important. God always tell you in advance what he's going to do if you read the Bible. If we, we can always get out of character with God when we don't read the Bible, when we don't take him seriously. God is always, he told, the, he told these Israelites way back in the beginning, especially in Isaiah, that Jesus is coming, and this is the way I'm going to do it. But, but we, a lot of times we cannot accept it because we're so caught up in the movement of life rather than the intimacy with God. So it's very compassionate here in, 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 in verse 28 in, in chapter 8 in the book of Romans. He said, and we know. He said, and we know. And, and, and then, of course, he starts the scripture with, and we know. But that's the text that I'm taking because the context of it is that he had already elaborated and expounded on, on how God had had manifest to us his grace in Christ Jesus and, and that there was no other way and he, he had, you know he, he had gone through where the law was ineffective and he had gone through where there's nothing else we can offer up and we have to accept it so he says and we know he was explaining to them he said we know that all things work together for good to them that love God <laughs> We know that all things, get this in spirit, and it don't seem like it sometimes, but when you, when you really have a relationship with God and, 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 you, and you are walking with him and you're in tune with him, God does not always tell you uh, verbally, uh, audibly, what he, but he gives you revelation, and revelation comes by the Holy Spirit indwelling us. When we, when we accept Jesus Christ, we have the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit, what he does is he teaches us the things of God. So he reveals to us. God doesn't get, he doesn't take a vote. He don't say, well, you know, I'm getting ready to do this. Or, is it okay with you? I'm getting ready to do. And so that confuses us, especially when we pray to God. We, we can pray to God and we can say, you know, well, God, I need you to do this. God, I need you to do that. But, but if it's not working together for the good, 
then God is not going to do it. Bottom line, if, if it's not working together for the plan that God already has in place for whatever he's doing, even in your personal family, even in your work environment, if it's not working together for the good, then God is not going to do it. And a lot of times we get confused when we're praying because we're, oh God, we, I need you to really bless me here. I need you to really do this. I really need you to do that. But, but you have to remember that before you knew God, God already had a plan. God already had a plan for my life and your life. And so when he draws us in by, by his spirit to Christ Jesus, he's not just drawing us in. He's not saving our soul for nothing. He's drawing us in because he has a purpose for us. Let me, let me show you this in, in verse 28. He says, this is what it, uh, the, the fourth verse says, and we know that he's talking to those who really believe that, that, that believe in God, first of all, and also believe in Jesus Christ, but believe in God, first of all. He says, and we know that all things, and remember the people he was ministering to, they believed in God. They just didn't get the system that God was doing so easily. God had changed the whole dynamics of their religion. And so, so what they were practicing, and so they didn't, they didn't get it so easy. So he says, and we know that all things work for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purposes. A couple of things he's saying that, that are very, very important. He says that we know that all things work together for good. He didn't say my good or your good. He said for good. That's the whole scheme of things. God is our father. He understands the plan of life. He understands what he's doing. So we have to trust God. So he says to them that love God. That's the first thing he said. Then he said to them that are called according to God's purposes, not our purposes. So, so the thought is to them that love God. To them that love God. You got to remember, God don't explain himself. He don't take a vote. He, he just, once he calls you into the family of God, we, we are part of his program to, to, for salvation of the Jesus. I came to save the world. So we, are, we become a part of his plan for life. So, so to love God is to know God and to continually learn who God is as he reveals himself, to love God. He said to those who love God. He said, and, and to love God is to accept that God is all-knowing and all-powerful. Realizing God is all-knowing and all-powerful helps us to know he knows exactly what he's doing. Realizing God is all-knowing and all-powerful, it helps us to know exactly what he's doing. You know, you've had parents or you have parents, they'll make decisions. And they won't say to you, well, look, I'm getting ready to do this, I'm getting ready to do that. This is for our good. we got to get this done. You might say, well, mom, I want you to do something different. Dad, I want you to do something different. And they'll be like, okay. You know, but, but it didn't happen that way. And, and that's the way God is. He's our real father. So he don't come and try and get us to help him make decisions, even pertain to our own lives, because all things work together for good to them that love God. To love God is to give up that which is the enemy to God. The first thing I tell you is to love God is to know God and to continually learn who he is as he reveals himself. The second thing I tell you, I said to love God is to accept that God is all knowing and all powerful. Realizing God is all knowing and all powerful helps us to know he knows exactly what he's doing. To love God is to give up that which is the enemy to God and that which is at enmity with God. Now, what is the enemy? The world, the Bible says over in James chapter, chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is, is enmity. Enmity is to despise God, to, to, to be against God. Let me tell you something. It's so smooth. The workings of it is so cunning that we can be completely out of the order of God, be so deep in sin, and still say we love God. Well, that's a friend of the world. That's because what we're doing is we're saying, okay, God understands all that I'm doing, although his words say don't do it. <laughs> really? God understands that all that I'm doing, although his words say don't do it. Well, he, he understands that it's sin. He sent Jesus for that. And when we confess it to Christ, but with an anticipation uh, that Christ is going to cleanse us from all of that. That is not, not of God. So, so to love God is to give up that which is the enemy to God. There are ways about, about ourselves that are, are the enemy, that, that, that's worldly. That's, that's, that's worldly, that, that pride and arrogance and not giving God glory for, for life right now. I mean, just, just living, just being alive and functional and and not sick. You know, that's enough to give God glory for. 
But, 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 but the way of the world is, well, I'm doing this for myself. I'm helping myself. No, it's God's mercy and it's grace. Trust me. So, so, so he, he goes on, he writes this. He said, no, you're not that. Though. He said that the friendship of the world is enmity uh, uh, with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God, is the enemy of God. So there's a, there's a system that Satan it has, has gained authority over, and it's the worldly system. That's why the Bible says don't walk in the flesh, because the flesh is subject to the world. He said walk in the spirit or be led by the Holy Spirit. You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh of the desires of the world. The next thing I want to give you is that to love God is to know that nothing can separate us from the love of, from his love. Get that. That's very important. To love God is to know that nothing can separate us from his love. Because there's a lot of things that happen in life and it's like, okay. But Paul wrote over in Romans chapter, chapter 8, verse 38 and 39, he says, For I'm persuaded that neither death, get that, because see, God goes beyond death. With this crisis and people leaving and all these things going on, God goes beyond death. God is life beyond death. He says, he said, I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. In other words, he's saying God got you regardless of what you're going through. God's got you regardless, no, no matter how it's going. It might not seem like it, might not feel like it, but God, he, he's, he's got us. And so, 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 so loving God is, is, is in action more, or much more than words. We have, to, we, we have to let the Holy Spirit manifest it through us, the love of God. We have to, we have to yield to it. Uh, so then he gets into this. He says, back over into Romans chapter, chapter 8, verse 30, he says, to those who are called, I'm sorry, Romans 8, 28, to those who are called according to his purposes, according to God. Let me, let me say this to you, brothers and sisters. God didn't save us for our purposes. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you think about it. He didn't call us for our purposes. It's a lot of people. Check this out. It's a lot of people get frustrated. With, with, they walk away from the faith because God did not perform for them. Or God didn't do. Or they'll get depressed. <laughs> to get down trying to say it because God didn't do what I thought he would do, what I prayed to him to do. Well, well, it didn't fit in his purpose. See, 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 this is what the scripture actually says, and I'm going to read the whole scripture, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purposes. According to his, not our own purposes. God did not call, he did not go to the extremes of saving you and I this is very important because it can take you out of depression. It can take you out of sadness. It can take you out of feeling unworthy. It can take you out of, out of depending on the opinion of man. God carefully predestined us to be saved in his son, Jesus Christ. I'll read it to you. Here it is. And, and, and let's go on down a little farther and read verse 29. For whom he did for no. He already knew you. He already knew he was going to be saved. He also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate. We were predestined for God's purposes. And so when we yield and sur surrender our lives to God in Christ Jesus, we can experience a life that's unimaginable, even, even, even as we're coming out of all of this. In, in, with, this, with, this with this virus and we're coming, we, life is coming back to a place. As we're coming out, it's, it's so critical that we realize that that all things now are important with God. Because, because if he allowed us to live and he allowed us to come up out of it, he's got a purpose. It behooves us to find the purpose. I want to read just a little more if you don't mind. Uh, in verse 31 it says, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And now you remember he's talking to a people where he's shifting the religion on them and getting them in, in, in stride with what God is doing now. He says that when we accept Jesus Christ, God is for us. Accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So he says this. He said, he said, he said, he said what shall we say then? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for, for all, how shall he not with him all self freely give us all things that he, that he can use in our lives for his glory? Do you know if we can transition out of out of self and, and selfishness 
and really get into the Lord and begin to yield to the Holy Spirit and walk according to the leading of the Holy Spirit, the life that God has for us is greater than the life we want for ourselves. It, it, it's greater. The Bible even says that it has not even entered our minds into our hearts. Our, we can't even realize what it is when we love God, all that he has for us. It's greater. We, we, we can't, it's not possible. So our concentration need to be on loving God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our minds, and then loving our neighbor as ourselves, and then realizing that I want your purposes, God, because you saved me so that I can experience the life you've ordained me to have. That's, that should be our concentration going forward as we're coming out of this and God, I surrender my life. I mean, you know, right now is a good time to begin to say, God, you know, all over again, I want to start over. I really, because I think I might've missed you. I thought that really you saved me so that I can give you a, a wish list I thought maybe you saved me so that me and you would be able to walk on my terms, but God, I missed you. It's not even about that. It's about you being sovereign, you, you being the God who created the whole heaven and the earth, choosing me to be your very own so that you can help me to have a life that's worth living. Thank you, God. Thank you. So that should be our concentration as we go forward. We should focus in on the fact that, you know, changes have happened. We, we, have a new, we have a brand new beginning now. We can really start over. And we got to be willing to drop some things off, let some things go, get some things out of our lives. Whatever the Holy Spirit leads us to do, give it back to the Holy Spirit because man is weak without the power of God. The, the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So you have to give it to God in prayer and say, God, help me in the name of Jesus Christ. And God can do that. Look for the, the power of the wisdom, the favor of God to manifest in your life now. Yield to that. Don't, don't think you know everything. Forget about what you think you know. Don't, don't be afraid of where God is sending you because he's with you. He'll give you wisdom and knowledge. Just don't worry about what you're going to say. I'm inside of you. I'm going to give you the exact words you need to say. So don't be intimidated when, it, when it's time to go before those that are greater than you, those that are in a greater position than you are. Don't worry about what you don't have, but be willing to listen. You got two ears, one mouth. Be, be willing to hear. Listen, the more you listen, as I move through life and, and I've yielded to the Holy Spirit, I've learned that the Holy Spirit is very real. And, and as I'm talking to people and interacting with those that are greater, that have accomplished more, that the Holy Spirit can teach me. He can teach me. As I'm sitting there talking, if I'll listen to the Holy Spirit, as, if, as I'll listen to the need, he can teach me. So we gotta be focused on more hearing now than talking because God is moving you and transitioning you into places you don't, that you cannot go without him. Now, if you could get there without God, you would already be there. Stop tripping, stop playing, stop, stop that. You're just being foolish. You, we cannot get there without God. Be honest with yourself. So if you have these aspirations and you have, you have desires to see greater and you have hope to see greater, tighten your relationship up with God. My wife was reading to me last night about the, the, the circle, the, the, the guy who wrote the book about, and, and, and it, it talks about drawing the circle in the middle of the room and getting down on your knees. There needs to be an intimacy with God when you're listening. When you're, you don't need to tell God everything you want, and he know about your problem, just ask God to help you. Say, God, I, you already know I need you to help me, but now I'm really yielded so things will get better. So, because I know you love me, I know that you for me is more than the whole world against me. God, I need you, but let me tell you this, brothers and sisters, before I leave. That's not possible without Jesus, without a relationship with God, without accepting Jesus Christ as Lord, without a relationship with Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, because the Bible literally says, Jesus said it, no man can go to the Father except by me. He also said that no man can come to me except the Father draw him. I'm believing God right now to draw all of us that are not anchored in Christ to Christ Jesus. Because to, to, sometimes when you go to the altar and you hear everybody say, all you got to do is confess, and it's, it can be so confusing. No, it's, it's deeper than just a confession with your mouth like that. What it is, is it's a belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Then the confession, based on what you believe. I believe that, that God sent Jesus. He's the Son of God. He came in the earth through a virgin birth. He lived a holy life. He, he was beat for my transgressions. He was hung on the cross to take a, to, for his blood to be spilled on my behalf so I can have, so I can be atoned back to God. 
And then he, he, he was taken off the cross and went to a grave and God got him up out the grave. And because he got out the grave, I have eternal life. So I have a new life and eternal life because Jesus took all of my sins on him. And now he's given me a new opportunity, which is daily, moment by moment. And he's given me an eternal life where I can live with God forever. So I don't have to be afraid of death. You don't have to be afraid of anything in the earth when you really trust God. So that's what this is all about when you say, well, confess with your mouth. So if you believe that Jesus Christ sent God and that he's done everything to save us and that he's answered the, answered the requirements of God on my behalf, then you say, well, Jesus Christ, I need you to be my Lord. I need you to be my Savior. I'm asking you to help me. And then, and then trust that he comes in. Ask him to come into your heart and be Lord. And then trust him to come in. Then you confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, I do believe that you raised Jesus from the dead, and I thank you for saving my soul, and I thank you for baptizing me in the Holy Spirit and teaching me the ways and the things of God. Brothers and sisters, if you've done that, you need to be baptized, you need to find a good church home, and you need to grow spiritually. My prayers are that God will be with you and that he will give you wisdom and understanding as to what you've done on this day. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to I make sure that you know we still are we're still are receiving the tithe and the offering because we as believers, we are committed to do that. We are committed to God to do that. We're submitted to God to do that. And so, so we need to continuously give. We need to also make sure that if we can help others, we can help others. But we need to give to God what it belongs to God first. Because, because that is a part of it. You know, it's easy to say, well, I'm not you know, going to church. I'm not. And a lot of you guys are doing that. I'm not going to church. I'm not. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not, not going to give. But that's not, that's not what a believer does. A believer stay with it because they understand that this is only momentary. We got to get back and everything needs to be in place when I get back. And it'll be in place because I did what God asked me to do. Hey, I love you. I thank God for you. My, my prayers are that, that you are blessed and that you're totally and absolutely trusting God moving forward. And we will get back in the building. I will let you know as soon as God let me know. I love you very much. Be blessed in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.